Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here. It's really nice to have this opportunity to try to consolidate some of the science that we've been looking at about changing precipitation in the Arctic. So it's long been simulated that precipitation would increase in the high latitudes as climate warmed. So we would expect according to basic thermodynamics that there would be a wetter Arctic. And indeed, some high profile studies in recent years have not only predicted an increase in Arctic precipitation, but also attributed that to sea ice retreat. The Arctic has been heating up much faster than the rest of the world, where at the annual scale, according to ERA 5 data, it's warming like seven degrees in the Barents Sea and around Svalbard. Huge change in the last 50 years. This is total precipitation, liquid and solid. According to ERA 5, the Arctic is getting wetter, more precipitation, especially around places like Svalbard, Southeast Greenland coast, the Norway and Iceland coast, Alaskan uh, Southern coast. If you look at snowfall, it's decreasing in the warmest areas across, say, the North Atlantic or uh, South Alaska. The snowfall, according to ERA 5, is still increasing over Greenland, uh, north of Svalbard, as you can see, the last 49 years. And the change in rainfall is largest by magnitude in the ERA 5 data. The increase in rainfall, it is what explains the overall precipitation increase. And in a warming climate, of course, this decrease in snowfall is because more of the precipitation is falling as liquid as that threshold for, of the melting point is being crossed more frequently. The GPCP data based on observations for the Arctic north of 65 have a, a very modest 2% increase in the 40 years uh, covering this data set. And this study links the wetter Arctic Ocean atmosphere, they really focus on the Arctic Ocean to the loss of sea ice and the increased moisture flux from the surface. Vima and others 2016 find from observations increasing humidity at the surface. Ceres and others, 2012, found in Radioson data increasing mid-troposphere humidity. Walsh and others increased clouds. This is where we get into feedbacks and how the increased clouds have a, a warming effect on the surface. With my AMAP work, it was interesting to compile the river discharge data from the great Arctic rivers, and in all cases, the river discharge is increasing. Another study compiles 40 years from 36 uh, Arctic radius on stations and concludes that humidity is increasing in these observational records. A study that looked at long term precipitation records around Greenland concluded increasing precipitation uh, since 1890. I published this study in 2013, concluding there was a 12% increase in Greenland's snowfall. And the interdecadal variability does correlate with Northern Hemisphere surface air temperature. The slope of that correlation is right where you would expect it at the plus 7% increase in precipitation per Kelvin. That's the slope of the clausius clapeyron saturation vapor pressure dependence on temperature. There was an even higher correlation for North Atlantic sea surface temperatures. We struggled to find any periods of time when the snowfall rates were decreasing. They were increasing in practically every time period that we could identify. Now, Staying on Greenland, uh, zoom into the rainfall measurements. Since 2016, 
we have been putting on an external uh, rain gauge, you can see uh, on this weather station in an experiment to see what kind of uh, signals we could get. And here I did a full energy budget comparison of one really large rain event from September 2017. The energy budget, according to the weather station, you can see the second uh, graphic down, uh, has the net turbulent flux. The purple line is the dominant source of energy. This has been shown by Fausto and others 2016 that the non-radiated fluxes are dominant during uh, these warm onshore advection cases. And on the bottom, you, you see the melt with and without the heat from rain. And indeed, if you ignore the heat from liquid precipitation, uh, there is a mismatch from the calculated. And it's only by adding that extra energy, the heat from precipitation, that you get that extra 15% uh, of ice melt from this rain. In other words, the, the melt impact directly from heat addition to the surface during rain is plus 15%. It's not a huge impact. Here's Andreas Alström admiring our finished job at South Dome. Uh, so just three days after we installed this station at 2,850 meters, uh, we had a few millimeters of rainfall. And then again and again, we had rainfall at the Southern Ice Sheet Dome. The temperatures showed melt at South Dome at a higher frequency than we had observed in the earlier GCNet data. So 2021 really was uh, exceptional in that way. It had melted at South Dome um, a bit off and on in 2012, 2010, but that was one of the interesting things about 2021 because it started out quite late melt and this year was really uh, more variable. One of the rain events where rainfall was witnessed at the summit station in Greenland was connected with an atmospheric river that's transporting not just moisture, but heat. And this mid-August 21 rain event, as we studied this, it, it became more like, okay, this is more about a heat wave than it is about a, a rain event. I made this map with passive microwave melt frequency in the, in the colors behind. And on the second day, the 14th of August, that's where AMSER 2 gets melt at Summit Station. We indirectly calculate there's three millimeters of rainfall at Summit. At the other freshly installed Greenland Climate Network stations like CP1, we measured 15 millimeters. And so using output from Dirk Van Asse's K transect energy budget model. And you can see that the heat wave around the 14th of August has huge net turbulent fluxes, the sum of the sensible and latent fluxes, much larger than the net short wave in the orange line. The melt energy during the heat wave is, is huge, but as you can see, the sensible and latent are both contributing oddly a, a very close amount to each other. Uh, so it's really the, the heat of the air mass, which is leading to melt, you can see on the lower graph at a, at a much steeper rate. And then kind of before and after it, at this elevation, 950 meters, there are equivalent melt rates before and after the heat wave. So that's not all that surprising. But when we go up to above snow line to Can U, this is where it got a bit more interesting and where we learned something about the feedbacks that you have a similar pattern of main energy sources, the net turbulent flux uh, on the 14th of August. But then the net turbulent flux has actually become negative at daytime, but the absorbs solar radiation in a snow covered area becomes dominant. And then you get time integrated as much melting during the sunny period because the snow surface had gotten darker because of the melting. The bottom graph has the gray line and that's when you hold the albedo constant 
at the snow value of 0 0.8. And that we worked out the difference that the albedo reduction, which for this snow cover, you can see the observed albedo at Canyu got down below 0.65, right down to the bare ice albedo value of, of around 0.6. And the, the impact therefore of this albedo feedback, or the darkening of the snow, you can see um, the difference of 164 millimeters uh, with the observed albedo and 108 millimeters with uh, kind of neglecting the, the, the melt driven darkening of the snow. Once again, the rain impact on melting was around 15%. So this study we confirmed once again, as kind of reality check. Well, the rain is uh, conspicuous and it does get people's attention. The more interesting factor was the darkening effect and the subsequent sunshine, which produced these really large uh, net shortwave fluxes you can see in the orange curves uh, in the uh, later part of this uh, episode. My last slide um, is just to talk about some of the other impacts. And these are three days, the 20th, 21st, and 23rd on the K transect. Um, and one thing that you can see is the bare ice surface gets uh, less water saturated and so less blue. And so the, the darkening effect of the water saturated ice um, kind of quickly goes away. And the dark blue ice is only dark blue really under relatively cloudy conditions. So the albedo feedback on uh, water saturated ice is I would say modest. Something else you can see here is the flooding conditions on the right side of the image. Um, you'll see the progression of these blue water saturated snow areas. And the whole story about uh, the water flooding, and you can see the river networks in uh, this 10 meter imagery is a super fascinating and uh, not fully explored topic, the rain on bare ice. I didn't talk about biological factors, but that's certainly on the science agenda. And I hope that there's some time for discussion. Thanks for your attention. Um, so you were talking about a correction factor that you were using to correct uh, rainfall amounts uh, in the observations. Uh, is that was it? Is that some kind of uh, uh, formulation that uh, depends on wind speed or so? So to account for undercatch or what is it exactly That's what right. you were correcting for there? Yeah, there's a kind of famous 1998 WMO report. Uh, it was um, Barry Goodison and other and and um, Daking Yang and others involved in that study. And the, the truth is there's very, there's not that many data points in that correction where they take the Tretiakov um, uh, shielded, double shielded uh, reference standard gauge and then versus an unshielded. And there, it's not a very robust correction. Um, it is what it comes down to. And that's, you can also correct for so-called wetting losses and evaporation losses, these trace factors. And I, I, my sense is that they don't add up to a whole lot more, the, those, the wetting losses and trace factors. Um, it, if you're trying to get the absolute rain accurate, uh, good luck. Uh, but what we are getting is uh, the signal, when did it happen? And, and the really large events, uh, I think the signal to noise is, is lower. So I'm not too worried about um, measuring rainfall accurately. Uh, we're getting enough of a signal. Uh, we can do sensitivity studies, you know, and uh, I, I don't think we're off by a factor of two. I think the errors are something like 30% at most, you know, so, so then you can get on with it and, and work out, is it really melting ice? And uh, I was a little uh, disappointed, I'd have to <laughs> admit that after all that work, we get plus 15% melt for a bare ice. Uh, I see. Uh, I was wondering, um, you were showing a graph with temperature excursions, which sometimes peak above zero. Um, is there actually uh, evidence that there are many rainfall events happening also for negative near surface air temperatures? I can imagine that uh, you might have right. relatively cool uh, near surface temperatures and the temperatures increase rapidly. Uh, above I, the that's such a, 
a, such an important question because then the, you can get after the rain on snow. I, I, I think you know what you're getting to there. The, the rain on snow, um, I, I didn't find any such events. Uh, in fact, the, the, the above melting air temperatures always preceded the rainfall in the 2021 cases. Um, but I, I would imagine that there, there are some uh, s real rain on, on um, frozen surface uh, cases. And then the, the latent energy transfer becomes much, much larger if the, the liquid water can refreeze because the latent heat of fusion is many times greater than the, the, the latent heat of, uh, of just the, or sorry, the heat capacity, the specific heat of, of ice is like a factor of 20 less than the, the latent heat of, of fusion, which uh, when there's refreeze, that's when you really heat the surface. So that, that condition that you're, you're talking about is, is high impact. And that would be when the rain really does some damage.